uh, our presenter today, uh, Dr. Victor Tenorio. Uh, his research focuses on decision support systems and smart mining for optimizing productivity. He is currently professor of practice at the University of Arizona, and today he's going to be discussing Luna Mine Planning, a hands-on approach to starting mine operations. Please give him a warm welcome and we'll turn it over to him. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan, and uh, 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 thanks for the introduction. Um, actually, I'm uh, co-presenting today with a student, Kers Kingsbury. Uh, he, he's going to appear uh, also at, at, at some point uh, during the uh, uh, presentation, but <clears throat> this is a kind of a collaborative work uh, uh, between uh, a few enthusiasts that are uh, at the University of Arizona, uh, in particular the Mining and Geological Engineering Department, and uh, uh, also focus in a, in, a, in a research group called Mine Intelligence Research Group, which is basically where I started my, my doctoral uh, research and, and dissertation, and then I, I had the opportunity to keep it. Uh, it basically, it's basically, it starts like a control room and a platform for testing technologies, but goes beyond that because uh, uh, we would like to use it as a, as a, um, um, a launching pad for for the future generations of of, of miners. Uh, so uh, and also Kapil Gala, who is not going to be here, but is another student who uh, both of them are uh, deeply involved in in, in mining activities. Uh, uh, Kers uh, he will be presenting himself, but is having a, a minor in uh, uh, planetary sciences. So I think that's a uh, uh, sufficient uh, specific uh, weight uh, for for uh, contributing in the presentation. So. Um, uh, we're going to uh, cover um, uh, a, a topic that basically is a concept, but uh, it's it's based on what we know what to do. I mean, we as mining engineers, and we wanted to put the, the mining portion on the on the on the uh, uh, on on all this project of, of going to the moon and start seeing it as a as a destination or a, a, or as, uh, several sites for for extracting uh, uh, moon resources that would be uh, minerals, metals, non-metals, and and, and uh, water in, in in the shapes that we will find them. We expect to find them. Uh, so the concept goes there and and uh, presents how this approach would be. Uh, uh, done and, and how we will start doing the uh, opening opening the mine. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a case study uh, and, and Kers is going to uh, explain uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the target site is one of the target sites that is uh, becoming one of the most notorious in the in, in the in the mine in the moon in the moon exploration and then uh, how uh, this uh, give us more uh, inspiration for for uh, uh, the, the future uh, ahead. Um, and hopefully there is questions or so. So uh, I want to introduce the University of Arizona. I know that some of the previous presentations and thanks for that, they uh, presented some of the things that uh, the University of Arizona has been doing for a number of years uh, since the uh, uh, a, a, a mapping of, of the uh, landing sites and, and, and many more. And in the recent years, we've been uh, also contributing in many ways with the uh, um, uh, monitoring the the landing of of uh, spacecrafts or, or probes on 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 mars and and also uh the yes the uh, the biosphere experience that also was uh, a, an important uh, 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 actor in the in in this uh, uh, evolution into the the, the space mining um, uh, program or space mining business in general um, and and we're happy to to uh, be part of it and uh, in in perhaps one of the most uh, important that we are we're proud we we are working and many of you already know that uh, we're not just uh, monitoring but uh, participating actively with the osiris rex uh, uh, project and uh, uh, we're we're uh, uh, impatient to to have that sample uh, on the earth uh, we perhaps we have to wait a Two or three years, or or less, but anyway, uh, 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 we are ready. Uh, there's many things that we would like to do to 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 those uh, 
uh, to those samples. Uh, uh, one of the things I just wanted to show one, one, one of the tools that we have is a, is a kind of rather new uh, <coughs> tool we have at the lab. It's, it's called the Hopkinson bar. And uh, basically uh, uh, induce, induces pressure into the rock samples and they pulverize it. Uh, so that <laughs> in a way we would like to keep it uh, 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 entire entire sample, but at the same time we need to learn things about the characteristics of the rock, and uh, that will be one of the the tests that are going to happen. So uh, hopefully it, it passes through our hands, and uh, we will be um, uh, doing doing some things with it. Uh, so with all this, I would like to to let you know that uh, the uh, university or in, in general mining engineering would like to contribute with the program and and this is where the the mining uh, the, the mining uh, part uh, is going to uh, participate um, another important event that also uh, puts us in a, an advantage uh, point for for the uh, uh, the program is the uh, uh, the Space Mining Law Summit. The last one happened on November of 2019. And uh, we had the privilege of, of having uh, astronaut uh, Harrison Schmidt, uh, Jack Schmidt, and, and uh, we learned about uh, the, the space law, the policies, all the, all the uh, challenges that are happening. We had uh, 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 people like uh, Andrew Woods, John Lacey, who is from from the law department, uh, Stephen Fleming also, who's been around the mining business uh, and um, how these strategies were going to be developed. There was a round, a very powerful round table uh, to talk about uh, the things that basically the relationship between NASA, private companies and so on, and uh, how these technologies are gonna be feasible. We start to see them uh, uh, one at a time and, and they're fantastic. And of course, the issues that are more important for for the uh, uh, concerns of space economics is the investment, the return of investment. This is business, and we want to make it uh, profitable. So perhaps, and this is also a comment at the end of this presentation, uh, that would be perhaps one of the things that we have to work in the following years: uh, profit, cost, and, and of course, what what to do with the material. We already know and we were talking that most of this will be used in situ uh, on the moon uh, uh, for either producing fuel or for habitat and for, for more. So I think it's uh, starting to uh, uh, be defined the, the, uh, the, the, the purpose of, of what we're going to do and, 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 and uh, why. And, and personally, I, I, I have very clear that we need to uh, build uh, launch pads, launching pads for uh, uh, trips from the moon that would be easier, uh, cheaper, lighter, and, 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 and perhaps faster for going to Mars or, or somewhere else. And then at some point, the construction of uh, a space station, a different one that we have now that could be closer perhaps to, to, to the moon and, and will provide a sort of um, interim um, a post for, for um, a, our, 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 our travelers. Um, so uh, with that, we are kind of focusing, and uh, this is part of an exhibit that we had last year. It was called Moon for the 50th uh, anniversary of the landing on the moon as, uh, as of today, the 51st. And uh, <clears throat> this is just to show the, the display that lasted the entire year, presented uh, many of the, the developments uh, from, from many years ago and, and the latest ones uh, about the, tar the target sites and how uh, uh, the possibility of, of finding uh, water in, in, on, on the South Pole is, is uh, every, every day. Even, even myself, I was kind of non-believer until I start to see uh, seeing these uh, discoveries and I said, but this has to happen and as when we have this proof proven and and uh, we can go for more uh, uh specific uh, steps to to follow and we have to concern about uh, worry about uh, <coughs> uh dedicate our efforts into uh habitats uh, and uh, we've seen some of them uh, in the earliest uh, uh presentations this morning and uh and uh, and here's where we are going to insert uh, how we are going to dig the, the uh, this this material and how to ex extract and and then processing and, and storing or or use them. So, uh, but these are just some some thoughts. Uh, we want to uh, present something more uh, um, 
more specific here. Uh, for, for this, we, we start with one of the many uh, uh, concepts that were, are uh, hovering around this, this topic, but this one is called a, a, a lunar outpost concept. And I put this in a sp specific because for me, it looks like a container in where I have my control room. And this is one of the things that we want to excel. And the sequel of this, I can tell you for the next year, we'll be presenting our prototype of control room for, for this uh, supervision. So this could be uh, having a line of line of sight to to the crater, the the, uh, the designated crater for where we are going to extract, and this is just in case we want to have visual uh, contact with our uh, equipment that is going to work. Um, and, uh, you see, there's a nice uh, parking spot there, and we have the operators. We we want these uh, operators to work uh, moderately to get uh, the least uh, expo exposition to uh, radiation or uh, other things. We have to work with uh, the um, the sunlight and the shifts will be <laughs> a typical shift. Uh, 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 if we talk in lunar days, would be fractions of of the lunar day. But I uh, just just a starter. We think that uh, operators in this type of rotation might work when uh, conditions are ideal, like two months. That would be two lunar days, uh, and and we have to start uh, subdividing the, the 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 days or the shifts. Uh, would be a different one, more or less like like Sol, uh, the, the the concept of Sol that was used in Mars and opening and closing the curtains according to that. So we can we can uh, simulate that on, on Earth and, and help uh, the operators there to supervise. Even though the equipment that is going to work will be as we are going to present it, uh, fully autonomous, uh, they need uh, human human help and we need to uh, uh, help to uh, pick up the pieces and and, and uh, uh, keep the continuity on, on working here. But basically, this is a, one of the public domain concepts that we would we, like to grab and, and to uh, uh, introduce. Behind this is um, uh, all uh, big infrastructure. We may have inflatables, we may have 3D printing and other things for the habitat, but this one is more uh, uh, operational driven, it's more for, for production. And uh, it also important, and, and, and Kerso is going to present the the, the uh, position, uh, privilege position, the vantage point from where we could be using the this uh, 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 um, um, system. I think there are some questions here, but I will uh, rather uh, continue. Uh, okay, um, okay, very good. So um, I will continue and. Um, uh, this, these are some of the moon resources. Uh, this is, oh, uh, let me jump, something happened here. Okay, very quick, uh, some of the things. This this was has been said before, so I'm not going to uh, uh, enter into much, the many details, except that we are, there are tangible and intangible resources. The tangibles are metals and minerals and rare earths and uh, the, the soil as itself and, and the water and the intangible resources will be basically solar energy and the privileges of having microgravity, ultra high vacuum and so on. And then we have um, uh, some other details in pos possible minerals or metals that we may find in, in the regolith. But we are more focusing on, on ice today and uh, something is happening with it. Uh, wait. Can I, okay, oh, I think, uh, yes. At this point, I'm going to leave, um, a, a, first, please uh, go ahead with, with your uh, part of the presentation. Thank you so much, Tito. And uh, can everybody hear me? Um, just, uh, all right, sweet. So our lunar case study, um, our first image on the left over there um, focuses on the moon's south polar region. Um, the leftmost image is a map of neutron absorption data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. The higher the neutron absorption rate, um, the greater the probability of, wider, of water ice existing on the floors of this crater. Fabius and Shoemaker appear to have some of the densest counts in this region. Figure 2 is a map from the Lunar South Pole Atlas. It shows the percentages that certain landforms remain illuminated throughout the year. The characteristic permanent shadow can be seen on many crater floors, while elevated ridges are bathed in near constant sunlight. Figure 3 represents an adapted elevation map, which was the site chosen for our case study of Luna Mine Planning, which is Savius Crater. 
This is due to the high likelihood of superficial water ice, as well as proximity to an area of illumination due to high elevation. The sites of our case study include a solar slash communications array on the mountainside, um, marked by a dot, an excavation site on the floor of the crater, marked by an X, and an outpost and processing plant located approximately between both, represented by a crosshair. In figure four, um, it utilizes the same dimensions as figure three, but shows the average terrain slopes for the area. Hills and crater walls represent the steepest slopes. The transportation route is represented by a dashed line which connects all the facilities along the path of least slope which should not exceed more than 10 degrees for this path. And Tito, can you go to the next slide real quick? Yes. Okay, there you go. All right, so this is um, a, a little higher resolution image. Um, uh, uh, it's it's basic, basically an additional uh, elevation map of the case study area. The sites are labeled here. Um, and using map scales, an approximate distance between the solar communications array and the outpost was approximately 8.6 miles, and the distance between the outpost and the extraction site being 9.9 .9 miles. Additional support stations may potentially be placed along the route. Uh, next slide, please, Tito. Yes. For our equip uh, equipment selection, among a wide and ever-growing selection of autonomous rover designs for extraction purposes, we believe the RAZOR design is most synergist with our planning system. RAZOR stands for Regolith Advanced Surface Systems Operations Robot and uses spilling, uh, spinning hollow bucket drums that are uh, able to both collect and store regolith. Due to a net zero reaction force system, the lightweight rover can work in zero gravity conditions. And can you go to the next slide, please, Tito? Yes. Here we see some of the design specifications for the Razor um, with some of the most high important uh, high importance uh, factors being its regolith per load amount, which is 90 kilograms, and its amounts of 100 meter trips per one charge life, 20. Very good. I will now uh, give it back to Tito. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I uh, just uh, wanted to, uh, uh, during our research on the, uh, uh, the ideal, uh, ideal equipment we used on, on, on the moon, uh, Razor was one of the, the strongest uh, candidates, especially for what we know as miners do the load hole dump. This is loading the material from its, uh, the, the site, carrying to a distance, a uh, 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 short distance uh, preferably, and then dumping to another convenient place uh, where it's going to be uh, accumulated. Uh, the uh, easy racer is a concept, like a, sort of like a game. I like it, I put it on my, on my telephone and I, 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 I brag saying, oh, I, I, can, I can from here, I can operate a, from, uh, 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 an equipment on the moon. And that's one of the concepts that uh, perhaps in the future, uh, uh, the post, the supervisory post will be different. We may need people living there and working and processing, but the supervisory uh, um, activities might evolve from the direct line of sight to something more sophisticated, like a, like a more a proper uh, control room and so on. But anyway, so the, the idea, we are welcoming in our, in our concept, the, 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 the console. And I think we have skipped the, the, the lunar mine planning uh, um, slide. I would like to, uh, for some reason we jumped it. And uh, if I can try to go back. I believe it's right before the case study. Okay. Okay, anyway, so um, let's go and continue with this. Um, yeah, well, this is one companion that, uh, I, actually not exactly this one, but this is one that I, I I'm sorry, something is jumping here. Um, and um, this is one companion that I uh, would like to add uh, into our um, site for working. Uh, this is Chaos, uh, um, a platform that has a, a, a very, a, uh, versatile uh, legs that act uh, like uh, like tracks or 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 a, a different. Dif it can chal uh, uh, 
face different challenges in, in the difficult terrain. Uh, this, well, this has been tested on the Earth. Let's see if it works properly on the Moon. But uh, there now, uh, lately, there were several evolutions. I had the chance to see this personally, how this technology has evolved. Uh, so we can add things like a sort of a, uh, an arm. But uh, the most important is the payload that they can, they can have and also the way that they can work anywhere. So I would like to have sort of this type of equipment uh, on on, uh, on the surface. Uh, this perhaps is the most important um, uh, uh, slide in where we are showing how the first operations will be. We have the supervisory post that was mentioned originally uh, and the uh, access uh, through a uh, ramp. We have to take care of the um, slope that we are going to use. Uh, ideally for uh, in, on Earth, the ideal slope would be from zero to 10%. I think eight to 6% will be okay for the racer and, uh, and, and then entering and we can have one or several of these working at the same time. So we can have a sort of an array. I, I was thinking on a dozen of these working at the same time, entering and create a chamber and then perpendicularly access and uh, complete the, the, uh, the, the pass and leave columns to, uh, to self-support. Uh, self but this is one of the ideas. This is one of the methods. We have to re, re, revamp the, uh, all the mining methods on the earth and present them uh, uh, on, 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 on the moon. And, uh, and chaos is there, is working like a small spider. Uh, perhaps uh, 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 helping in, in many, many ways. And this could be a companion, totally autonomous or teleoperated if you want. Uh, also, I'm presenting the CubeSat array. CubeSat is another uh, portentous development uh, that happened at the University of Arizona in the Systems and Industrial Engineering Department. And it's basically cheap uh, cubes. Some of them are very, quite small. You can deploy them, make them orbit. You can put them solar cells, solar panels. And, and become the, the first array of uh, 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 network nodes, our internet, our lunar wide web, uh, uh, and, and, and so on could be. And also they can use them for GPS and other, other purposes. Uh, for the moment, the, uh, uh, the, uh, we want to be prudent with our uh, uh, rather costly uh, um, uh, resource, and we want to put a tether there to um, uh, monitor them, uh, uh, sorry, uh, to control its, its advancement and also perhaps uh, uh, this is very, very quite simple, but uh, we may need to hitch it out if, if it gets ever gets stuck. So that's why we don't want to have a totally absent of people here, but that needs to be changed because we can have also autonomous technologies for hitching out the equipment and replacing them with other equipment that are standing by. Uh, the, for the moment, the, the, the way of controlling this would be, with, uh, the period would be the lunar day. The cycle would be one of the fractions of the lunar day. The tonnage is the, the actual tonnage that we have, and we have to be sure that we are counting it, uh, measuring it uh, uh, as a lunar weight and how, how much is going to be in actual tons. Uh, the slope is important, and it will be ever changing as the, the depth uh, of the um, um, uh, excavation uh, evolves, uh, who's the supervisor, if there's any, and the basic uh, standard measurement of mechanical availability and efficiency. Um, uh, this, uh, this is a section, this is a section that has been created for showing this. And I leave in the space for a, for a, a person if we need uh, uh, this person for, for assistance, mechanical assistance, but uh, that's the thing that will be changing. I would prefer to think that there will be no, no humans at all in this operation, but this is just in case we want to see how, how it looks. And chaos will be there hovering around our equipment and we can have a connection or extension. Perhaps we need a hitching ball or something to extract it. Uh, uh, the Wi-Fi that will be provided. I think that the tether will become a sort of a, a leaky feeder. Uh, for the underground operations. Uh, we need surveillance of some sort and special illumination if you want. And uh, the, the dimensions are kind of, could be subdivided in four sets. So I think we can start with this uh, a, a section. And, and then also we will have the, um, a, a, we will have the um, 
sorry. Uh, oh, the support. We, we might need some support and we need to know how the, the, uh, the material is going to uh, evolve here. Um, okay, uh, we're almost, almost there. Uh, these are some of the uh, potential issues with extraction. Um, um, uh, okay, uh, let me wrap it up. Uh, basically, we need to know exactly the nature of the material that we're going to extract. Uh, if it's going to be ice or it's going to be dirty material, sort of like the Halley Comet or, or so, uh, uh, it was called dirty snow. But this would be perhaps harder. Uh, okay, uh, the, we have to be careful and notice that uh, we don't, we want to keep the, um, the, the clarity of the, of, of the, um, uh, I mean, we have to control the dust and, and also keep the landscape uh, in the best way. I don't think it's going to be too notorious at, at the beginning, especially if we're going to extract this, uh, this uh, ice or water from the craters and not uh, impact uh, in the rest of the landscape, but it's important to work with extreme uh, temperatures, uh, radiation, others, uh, the, the stability was mentioned, and standards for transportation. Are we going to use roads or, or paths, or we are going to uh, use uh, perhaps sort of conveying conveying uh, infrastructure. Uh, I will say conveyor belts, but it would be covered conveyor belts or so, uh, and and improve, improve all, all the other things, and develop our first KPIs, uh, key performance indicators for the moon considering low gravity and other other issues that were not present on, on the earth and uh, do a very uh, excruciating, that's a cursed word, but <laughs> I like it uh, because the cost analysis will be important. We need to make this profitable and uh, and, and also we use that is going to have an, an application. Um, uh, the vision for the future, and with this we conclude uh, the, the presentation, is how the University of Arizona envisions uh, all the work that has to be done. And some of these things were previously mentioned as, as part of the uh, um, analog lab. Uh, so I think we are is compatible with that. But basically, we want to focus more on the supervisory systems, the uh, control rooms, uh, the what we want to mint the OTE of the Earth. Minerals processing also. I think hers that will be your poster presentation later, and uh, other things. Uh, the uh, traffic control, cloud-based traffic control. Basically, we, we can create a cloud or a network, uh, 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 an array uh, over over the moon, and, and uh, as quick as we can, and we can have Wi-Fi, and other other things that will have like augmented uh, reality, and be more uh, later focused on the space business and go back to the moon and, and make it make it every time uh, uh, better. Uh, some of our references that were mentioned and cited during our presentation and um, uh, that's that's it for now. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and if there are more questions we will be happy to to answer them in the Q&A or any other way. My name is Doug Plata. I'm the um, uh, the president and founder of the Space Development Network and uh, I have been to the University of Arizona Tucson many times, probably seven, eight times. Excellent. And in fact, I've visited uh, uh, GME uh, and um, Kimini, uh, Dr. Kimini, is, is he still the chair of the department? Uh, not, uh, not as of, not as of uh, this semester. Oh, very well, okay. So um, I have a, a concept for, um, for harvesting ice that would be uh, based upon, um, well, let me, let me just show to you. Let me see if I can share the screen. I'm not sure if I can. I will stop sharing mine if you want. So, so my concept is uh, Ice Harvester Telerobot. Uh, so let me, let me pull up this image here. 3D, okay. So here's a 3D printed version of it. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay. So the concept is a telerobot that combines multiple pieces of equipment all together into one. So this would be uh, obviously the, the the scoop at the front is a uh, an excavator, but what it does is it uh, brings it up, as you could probably imagine, brings up the icy regolith into the uh, the the neck. Of this of this uh, container and fill, fills up the body, 
and then the lid closes and seals, and then it actually tumbles uh, longitudinally um, as though it is a clothes, a clothes dryer, and it would actually be heating uh, the volatiles that are being exposed as it's tumbled like, like uh, wet clothes are exposed in, in a dryer. Uh, and it doesn't show up, but there'd be a tube from the center point in the back uh, and would come around to these volatile containers on the side. So here you have, you, you don't have to transport IC regolith uh, because you steam it out uh, in situ using battery power. Um, and uh, you don't need an oven because the body itself is the oven. Uh, and then the tail end opens up and the, the whole body lifts up and drops it out, drops the, the dry regolith as though it's just pooping it out, sort of like a dump truck does. Uh, and then it comes back down, closes the lid, continues to move forward and process uh, more uh, until the volatile tanks are, are filled. Then what it does is it backs up to uh, either a lander or a, um, um, a, a point of attachment for power. So to get power from the, the, the rims where there's uh, peaks of eternal light, uh, the power can be transmitted either from a wire that has been draped down the side of the wall uh, or uh, beamed uh, transmission, like microwave transmission to, to receivers, um, so that this could begin to process icy regolith uh, down in the craters. Now you'd say, well, okay, there's environmental issues here. So I've, I've, I've explained how the power would get connected to this vehicle, but uh, issues would be um, vacuum, which is you know, a solvable problem. Uh, there's the cryogenic temperatures. Uh, if the contact points were made out of aluminum, aluminum uh, does not become brittle at cryogenic temperatures as evidenced by the external fuel tank of the uh, shuttle. You know, that was holding liquid hydrogen and yet it went under max Q and didn't break apart, you know, in, in, due to embrittlement. Um, also, uh, internal heating uh, as necessary um, uh, could, uh, and in the vacuum, vacuum acts as a, as a um, uh, insulator. Um, and, um, and then abrasive regolith, I think that if it went uh, sort of slowly and if the joints were designed to, uh, to handle that, um, uh, and also uh, the motors and the joints w could be replaced with uh, quick release mechanisms and dexterous telerobots would come in and go ahead and place uh, replacement parts and a small massive part could keep an operation going and and producing large quantities of, of um, water and, and volatiles. So then what it does is it backs up, uh, connects to the power, uh, source of power, uh, and then starts um, distilling it to separate out the, the organics from the water. Uh, so you get distilled water and then the power it would be used to go ahead and, and uh, electrolyze the water into propellant. So basically all, all of the actions would be done within short distance uh, while remaining at the at the floor uh, of the uh, of the crater, um, if I, I'm wondering is if this concept, uh, if the MGE uh, might possibly be interested in uh, working maybe with other engineers on campus and actually developing this, putting it into a, a, a vacuum chamber with like liquid nitrogen temperatures uh, and actually um, demonstrating uh, its feasibility. What do you guys think? It uh, definitely sounds incredibly interesting. Um, I will kind of uh, give it up to Dr. Tenorio. Um. Well, uh, yeah, uh, any, anything that you would like to say, Kurt, would be great. But uh, the only thing I will say is that, uh, yeah, I, I work very close with Dr. Kemeny uh, at the university and, and uh, he was uh, a, one of, uh, a promoter of all these uh, initiatives. Uh, one of the many, I mean, all the other professors as well. And the good thing is that we can have collaboration with other departments. I, I foresee this as, a, as an integration of uh, systems and industrial engineering, perhaps mm -hmm. mechanical and aerospace, mm -hmm. uh, two very strong departments that are involved in, in, in many things that we were wondering uh, when we have the engineering design say, oh, wow, there are so many, many things that uh, uh, were done by, by them and, and, and that we would like 
And even for the first time last year, there was a sort of a, a development of, a, of an excavator for, for the earth though, uh, uh, though. but any, anyway, that could be used for uh, who, who a combination the of, of design. Well, uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering. Um, AME. The, I, I saw it on, on, yeah, AME, yes. I saw it on, on, on the engineering design day and I got kind of impressed, but we had one of our students working there. So that, that tells us the, all the possibilities of, of collaboration. I, I see this as totally feasible and, and uh, it, it, uh, I think it has to be proposed and, 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 and a prototype of, of some sort could be developed, I guess. And uh, yeah, engineering day is not that far, it's next, next April, so we can present something. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Yes. So, uh, yeah, I, I suggest that we continue uh, talking. Uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Kevin is a, is a great contact for that, and, and we'll be able to uh, contribute in one way or another, especially the sure, students. I, yeah. Uh, maybe I, I, I can easily find your guys' email addresses, and, and I have uh, John Kemeny's email address as well, so I'll go ahead and get a, you know, send a, a four-way email. Def definitely. Yeah, yes. Very that will work very yeah. well. Thank you, though. Great. Yeah, and also oh, I wanted to say, mention your presentation was great. It was very inspiring, and oh. and uh, I would like <laughs> uh, good to see that some other things are kind of uh, in the same in the same uh, uh, line of, of thinking. So that's a yeah. very good thing. Yeah. Great. Appreciate that. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, we're open for other questions. Actually, kind of we were throwing out some of these uh, concepts and, uh, and uh, well, we skip one of the slides, but it doesn't matter because basically it's the idea of the concept of having this or a sort of a workflow or, or, or a set of, or a console. I would like to put it later uh, when this uh, idea evolves as, a, as an application, a sort of a big app uh, uh, that will be uh, uh, basically the mind planning while we have on uh, the other side uh, a strategy for the maintenance or uh, 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 of equipment, machine health, and uh, maybe also human health if we have any people. I know we want to have the less people, uh, amount of people out there, and hopefully this is the way it's going to happen. But if we don't have them, we have uh, the habitats, and uh, they will be one way or another uh, stressed or concerned about uh, how much, uh, how many tons we are producing, and perhaps it will be good to keep keep also track of them and associate them, associate them with the with the productivity of our all uh, operations. I um, have a question, and um, do you think that um, a habitat needs windows, or can we accomplish that with cameras? Mm. I, um, I've, I've done a little bit of thought process on this, um, and I just believe the windows um, provide too much of a, a, a liability, I guess, and a hazard um, with, uh, with solar wind and any other high energy particles um, because it just allows for easier transmittance uh, through, through the material. Um, I believe I, it's, it's very um, interesting that you bring up cameras. I think that that would be a great alternative to, to being able to see the, the lunar surface with their own eyes. <laughs> so Hink, are you thinking about having like a, a flat screen TV, uh, TV on the inside and then a camera directly on the outside of regolith shielding? So mm -hmm. it's as though you're looking right through it? Well, that's mm -hmm. one way of doing it. But I mean, I, the, the, the cameras could be anywhere so that basically you could set up a, um, a, a series of cameras and then it would be like moving the habitat to different places. Uh, you know, the window would still be there. I mean, you could even have windows to earth for, so, so that people would like look out the window and see something familiar. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, but, but if you have a window on the moon, it just seems to me that like nothing ever changes. You know, like you would see, I mean, maybe every once in a while somebody would walk by or a rover would by, uh, drive by, but it would be pretty, pretty, how can I say, stark. <laughs> So anyway, I'm, I'm building a dome and I'm, I'm, I'm going to seal it. I'm not going to put any windows on it. I'm going to try the experiment of putting cameras on the outside so you can actually see outside. But I'm also going to experiment with virtual outsides and also with loca other locations um, with cameras. 
think there's there is a fascinating YouTube video that I saw about where there's this flat screen against the wall and there's a camera that can tell where the person is right to left and then what happens the image the image changes so you can actually sort of look around corners and whatnot and gives this sense that it's you're actually looking outside yeah so that works if you if you have just one person watching right if you have <laughs> one person watching then it like messes that up in well, um, with um, with with, with uh, some of the advancements with virtual reality and augmented reality, um, we may be able to um, just have a, a full scale view of the surrounding outside, um, just using a headset or or no headsets. Uh, so I'm going to try having uh, a situation inside of uh, a dome where it looks like the dome is transparent. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, then you're you're looking at the entire outside, um, unimpeded view in any direction. Um, so, anyway, that I'm I'm gonna try it. This is just something I think that mm -hmm. we need to try, and, and whether it's satisfactory psychologically. Um, now, for operations like going outside and and like fixing something that's broken, like moving something that needs to be moved, like um, I don't know, something got stuck somewhere. That just scares the heebie-jeebies out of me. I'd, I'd like to have lots of different kinds of robots that can do different things, including fixing things that are not working quite correctly and not put people in harm's way. I'm not saying that we should never do EVAs, but I don't think people should work. You know, work is something that, that, that we should be good enough with robots to be able to duplicate anything that a human can do physically especially when you're wearing one of those suits and your gloves are like fat and you know what I'm saying? That it's just not the same as doing something here. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for sure. I mean, autonomous options are going to be the, the first solution to, to lunar mining. And the, I think the goal would be to limit uh, people's exposure to the lunar surface as much as possible. Yeah, radiation shielding is going to be an issue. Like oh, you, you're only going to be able to spend so many, so many hours outside on the moon before you're have, starting to have real problems. Mm -hmm. So we might as well get used to doing things robotically or or with telepresence or something. Hank, was your was your question about uh, why do people need to go outside? Was that answered? Um, I kind of. I just wanted to share what where where I'm thinking and see if there's an objection because the original astronaut said demanded and got a window <laughs> on their space capsules, and and so I only I want to respect that that particular sentiment, um, you know, like being. But I think being enclosed in a tiny capsule for I don't know a couple of days would be different without a window would be different from being in a in a lunar habitat where they're there are lots of other ways of seeing what's outside. So I want to test that. I want to I want to find out if if we can work under those conditions or whether there's a absolute have to have a window or we're all going to revolt <laughs> kind of situation. <laughs> that is a uh, very fascinating. I'm going to have to uh, jump off this Zoom call because I have a a poster presentation myself in about 15 minutes. So I will um, leave you all with Dr. Tenorio to answer any more questions. And thank you all for uh, coming to our presentation. Yeah, I'll be on that presentation in a few minutes too. So uh, uh, I'll be happy to, to stay and, and until, until then and uh, continue. Okay, all good right. luck. Thank you, everybody. I'll just note that Dana Carson uh, posted here in the um, in the chat says Peter Koch uh, has periscope style designs where two mirrors mean only light makes it in. I, I've seen this where, you know, the the person is standing here and the, and the light uh, reflects off a mirror, another mirror, and comes out here so that you've got shielding, you know, the GCRs cannot get through, but you, the light can. And so you'd be standing there and you'd actually be like, you're looking out this window. Yeah. Yeah, but then you can still only see right where you are, where the periscope oh, is. Oh, okay, periscope. <laughs> so that's what it is, <laughs> talking about a periscope. And, yeah. and, you know, if we have like, you know, a dozen rovers, each with a camera out there, each one of them can be your periscope. True.
So, so you know, you can look Correct. at the distance, or you can look at it from close, or or whatever. So, I, I mean, we're we're no longer living in the U-boat days where where we, <laughs> where we have to Correct. step up to the surface and, and raise that periscope. You know, just yes. <clears throat> It's interesting thinking. And, and the, the other thing uh, about being able to see around corners, um, there's a, you can use a, a mirror with, um, when, it, when it's, um, how can I say, when you're in a flight simulator, uh, they have these, they have mirrors on the outside, or curved mirrors, they're called collimators. And that enables the pilot to look through the bars and, uh, and the clouds actually act accordingly. But it's all simulated. It's all simulated, so it's it's not like you've got a real unless you have a real camera somewhere that's actually moving. But I guess you could do that too. Yes, I, I think some of some of those uh, tricks might help my work very well for for especially for having this psychological perception that that you can see outside that you know where you are. Yeah. And uh, yeah, same happens at the uh, at the uh, uh, mining projects in, uh, in in the Andes, for example, high altitude, low oxygen, and you have to see outside because even like sometimes looks barren. Uh, you want to see what goes on uh, uh, around you. Uh, so some of these things have to be brought to the to the lunar settlements. If you look at well. the picture of the habitat that's behind me. There is there is yeah. a window. Uh -huh. that, I that see it. Cool. Very that good. Cool. Very and, uh, uh -huh. and some crews went to elaborate lengths to build a platform that they could sit there and like watch out the window on their down. Oh path. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure, sure. And, and That's and part of the hand of God. Yeah, is, I remember. It's lava rock, as far as the eye can see. Now on Earth, we get weather, so you get clouds. So there's all that kind of stuff that you're not going to get on the moon. So. Like, you know, unless you've got a robot out there doing something, looking out a window is going to be pretty boring. Mm. But you could digitally turn the black sky blue. You could put in some clouds. Just I like, mean, yeah, exactly. Anything. You could do anything. Then now you're playing psychological tri tricks on people to make them right. more comfortable. You know, like you could give them earth blue light, you know, like sky ah, light yeah. to make them feel better, which is all yes. things you could learn how to do before and see... You know, so I want to build this thing. I want to have people perform tasks inside and see if they perform the task better if they have fake windows or if they have sky or what's the conditions under which they they can operate optimally. And then so yeah, I think I think that psychologically the the trip to Mars is what really uh, has me worried because that's you know that is confinement psychology. Whereas if you're you know on the moon or, or you know, after you land on Mars, then you can be in very large, spacious, inflatable habitats with plants and all these sorts of things. But man, going to Mars, I mean, um, I think people could get pretty stir crazy. Yeah, so well, that was the original test. That's why we did four months, four months, eight months, 12 months and eight months with six people in 1200 square feet in, in the habitat. That was the original missions that we did in there. And basically, uh, you only got to talk to only your crew members. If you communicated with the outside world, we delayed that signal 20 minutes each way. So there's no live communication. Right. And if you leave the habitat, then it's an EVA. One person has to stay back to be mission control, and the other five have to wear space suits. And uh, we, we maintain those protocols today. Um, except it's, we're doing moon missions now. And so the, the, the delay is only three seconds if you're talking to mission control on earth. And um, basically we don't need to have people in there for eight months or, or a year. You know, we can have people in there for a couple of days or a week. And to, to address your question of uh, whether crew needs to go outside or, or if you just have telerobots, I mean, my feeling is that, you know, for day-to-day -day work, if there's anything that needs more dexterity than what a telerobot could do, which I'm not even sure that's necessary, but uh, they could always bring broken down equipment that needs repairing in through a, a, dry, a dirty garage into the clean garage, uh, and people could work on it inside. And it'd be far safer than suiting up and going out. 
Yeah. yeah. And and if we <laughs> needed if we needed to be able to do something which a human needs to do, meaning with that kind of manual dexterity, then we should create a robot which is an upper body of a human with arms and eyes and everything. And then you have the haptic controls so that you could use that thing and have the bottom half of the human be a rover. So that you could pretty much do anything that you could do uh, and you would have steadier platform than, 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 the, uh, than your legs because your legs are designed for one earth gravity, not one sixth. Okay, I, I guess I, I guess um, I, I'm going to have to go ahead and end it now here. Um, I have to jump on to a, to a presentation for another presentation here in about five. Party seven. pooper. Party yeah. pooper, yeah. <laughs> well, <there you> go. <laughs> <laughs> well th 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 thank you, Dr. Tenorio, for your presentation and, and uh, yeah, and um, and thank you for hanging on and staying on later. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, yes, that's it. Thank you. Very good. Well, I appreciate and thank you very much to everybody uh, for your uh, thanks for your attention. I, I'm sure we will see each other uh, uh, very soon. And we'll so, be. Uh, I will. Yes. Okay. We will. I will visit you in ASU. Oh. <laughs> I'm on the GIO, the Global Institute of Sustainability. So I go there for board meetings. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. All right. Excellent. Um, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm leaving now also to the other presentation and appreciate very much your attention, your questions, and uh, 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 we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.